have minimal contribution to global greenhouse gas emissions. So our biggest um, challenge is how to become more resilient to, to climate change impacts. So, so uh, adaptation is a key priority for the region. Not that we neglect mit mitigation, but we prioritize adaptation so that we can increase our resilience, especially in the sectors which are very, very, very vulnerable. Now, all sectors that are critical for sustainable development and maintenance of livelihoods are sensitive to, to, to climate change, especially the ones that are priority in our region. Now, the sectors that are listed in the, in the strategy include water, biodiversity, health, tourism, agriculture, fisheries, oceans, uh, minerals, extractive industries, and human settlements. Now, our... Um, TFCA is fall under the biodiversity sector because TFCA is a is a is an arrangement. It's not really a sector. It's an arrangement, but an arrangement that takes care of um, wildlife, that takes care of biodiversity in general. Next slide. Yeah, so okay, biodiversity in our region is very important and, 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 and we are one of the most biodiverse um, areas, even globally. South Africa, I think, is the third most biodiverse uh, country in the world. So you can imagine how much biodiversity we have, but we do have a challenge of uh, losing a whole lot of uh, our biodiversity due to a, a number of factors. So we hold more than 40% of the region's uh, species, which are endemic, and that is stated in the biodiversity strategy, but also in the TFCA program of 2013. I don't know if there's an update from, from, from that uh, TFCA program, which, has, which may have a different statistics. But uh, our biodiversity is also very important for um, this, not only for the ecosystem, but also for our human activities for our ecosystem services, for our societal needs. Uh, we have biodiversity economy, we have wildlife economy, because those are the areas which we are rich and that is where we can base our economy on. Um, biodiversity resources such as plants and animal products like timber, wildlife, tourism, account for a significant portion of our GDP in, our, in, in, in the region in general but also an important source of our livelihoods for most of our citizens. People that live in and around protected areas, they rely on, our, on, on biodiversity, they rely on wildlife, they rely on, 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 on protected areas for their livelihoods. Next slide. So it, it's very important for us to keep these systems intact because of the value they have in the region. So in 2018, uh, tourism, which is mostly associated with natural spaces or wildlife tourism, accounted for 8.6% of the GDP, and it created over 6 million jobs, that's 6.1% of the total employment within the region. So that just shows the value. And also in the IPBS Global Assessment Report of 2019, it shows that our that the global ecosystem is deteriorating and in a in a very in a alarming rate, and that doesn't exclude us as a region. We are also affected by these statistics. Um, and according to the regional strategy on biodiversity, which we have just completed and we've we've just revised, so it's not yet approved by ministers, but it's finalized and uh, validated. That reports indicates that 40% of the species are endemic to the region, which are endemic to the region are endangered. So we have examples of Madagascar, Seychelles, Mauritius, uh, which have a number of uh, important endemic species. And uh, other areas also like Central Africa have got um, endemic freshwater fauna. The Miombo forest, which covers about eight of our countries, is also an important ecosystem and it provides a wide diversity of um, uh, birds and butterflies, especially in Zambia, in Tanzania. Next slide.
Okay, so what are the challenges that we are facing? The challenges are, are, are that we are struggling to maintain this wide biodiversity productivity because it's diminishing at, at, at a very high rate. We have biodiversity loss, we have land degradation, we have overutilization of um, resources, we have unsustainable levels of development which are driven by economic factors and social factors. And we have climate change, which uh, also enforces um, the, 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 the loss of, of our biodiversity through, our, through floods, through uh, severe droughts, the, end, the ongoing El Nino and, uh, El Nino and, and, and other things. We also have poor enforcement of laws and regulations when it comes to pollution, to alien invasive species, which invade our um, uh, pristine spaces. We have over harvesting of natural resources. We have lack of recognition of indigenous knowledge, which is what has kept us over the centuries as Africans. And we have been sustainably maintaining our environment using indigenous knowledge but uh, there is lack of recognition of, of those kind of knowledge systems. There is, um, yeah, all those, they, they, they exacerbate the situation. And then that leads to the impacts. The impacts includes, include increased temperatures, increased erratic um, pre precipitation, extended dry spells, animals dying, species migrating, Corals bleaching, uh, bleaching in our coastal areas, in our uh, in, in our island, um, surrounding our island states as well. We have reduced water availability, like Seko has, has talking about, has been talking about um, the impact on the electricity sector because of the reduction in water. We have reduction in production and productivity in the agriculture sector, which leads to food insecurities. We have a whole lot of um, things that affect our goods and services on the ecosystem side, but also our human well-being. Uh, so, so, so those are some of the the, the impacts. And we've seen. Um, okay, there are some instances where we have seen the change in biodiversity having some good impacts on other systems. For example, the the comifora, which is a plant in uh, Namibia, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it has seen a lot of uh, an increase in production when when there's um, drought periods, but that's uh, isolated cases. In most cases, impacts of climate change lead to negative impacts. They lead to destruction of our ecosystems, including our uh, biodiversity, including our wildlife sector, including our TFCA uh, sectors. Yeah, next slide, please. So, according to the climate change strategy that I've that that I've, uh, um, I've referred to, adaptation is in the biodiversity is 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 the key um, sector that can provide. I mean, a key uh, response that can provide rural or communities with the necessary natural resource essential for our livelihoods. We know that our region were highly dependent. On natural resources were highly dependent on, on on biodiversity, so that's not just for for the ecosystems themselves, but it's also for us as human beings to survive. It's also for sectors like the tourism sector to to co to continue to thrive, and also to ensure that local communities can continue to benefit from the sustainable use of natural resources. These resources must also be assisted to adapt. So. We, 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 we need to consciously look after our resources so that they can look after us. Basically, that's what the strategy is saying. Next slide. Okay, so there's a number of recommendations that we, we are providing. First of all, we need to strengthen participation and synergies between partners and, and offer better opportunities to realize adaptation benefits for communities around protected areas. Now we are sitting in this platform coming from various uh, sectors. We, we all have one thing in common. We all want to conserve and look after our environment or our biodiversity 
or our ecosystems or wildlife, but we come from different spaces. Some of us are in government spaces, others are NGO spaces, others are in funding spaces, others are in academia, knowledge uh, services. So we need to find a way of um, uh, adapting and synergizing our efforts so that we can consolidate. We should also um, focus on implementation as member states of the global um, um, uh, uh, policies, including the CBD, including CITES, including CMS, and the regional uh, strategies on climate change, on biodiversity, on forestry, on wildlife, and on TFCAs. And uh, next slide, I think it's gonna be the last one or the second last one. So the recommendations from the strategy are that we need to reduce the fragmentation of protected areas and create integrated and connected land and water systems, such as the TFCA. So the TFCA is a, is a, is a useful example of how we can reduce fragmentation of protected areas. Uh, the second recommendation, next one. The second recommendation is that we need to implement incentive instruments that support mitigation actions and improve the management and conservation of natural resources by a variety of stakeholders. Each one must uh, improve on what they are mandated to improve. And then the last recommendation from the strategy is that, is that we need to promote sustainable management practices and approaches in all sectors in order to reduce habitat degradation, deforestation, and over-exploitation of natural resources. I think that's the end of my part of the presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Madam Zibongile. We will now move on to our next speaker, Dr. Nyambe Nyambe, who's the uh, Executive Director of the CASA TFCA Secretariat. Over to you, Dr. Nyambe. Thank you very much. Uh, am I audible? Right, thank you for the opportunity, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I think uh, allow me to preface my presentation by saying that uh, Kaza is a semi-arid biodiverse rich area and with two major river basins which also give it uh, its identity and with that background if we think of uh, as Sandra Postel mentioned if we think of climate change as a shark then water is its teeth and uh, certainly, as Bongil has illustrated, Kaza and other countries in the sub-region continue to feel the bite of rising temperatures, especially in the form of uh, floods and uh, droughts that are intensifying. And the impacts of climate are both on people, of climate change rather, are both on people and biodiversity, affecting different ecosystems and species differently. And I want to believe that uh, if in Kaza we can't treat floods, droughts, and other manifestations of climate change in a piece, piecemeal manner. And uh, in this presentation, I'll try and uh, illustrate what I mean by all this. If I can move to the next slide, please. So that's Kaza for you. And a landscape of 520,000 square kilometers with 19 national parks, more than 100 uh, game management areas, 85 forest reserves, two major river basins, as I've already indicated, and a population of about 3 million people. So everything comes into play when you're talking about climate change. Next, please. And just to remind ourselves when you're talking about TFCAs, we're talking about the definition that's been uh, clearly articulated in the SADC protocol on uh, wildlife conservation and law enforcement, but it also draws attention to the significance of natural capital, the importance of enabling policies, importance of impacts at scale, and of course, the transboundary focus, and also understanding that nothing can happen without collaboration, cooperation, and understanding amongst the member states and also the various stakeholders uh, that they collaborate with. Next, please. So that's just a map of uh, 
the transfrontier conservation areas in the Sardic region, and uh, which are measuring approximately a million square kilometers, and cars are contributing about 59%, about 60% of that. So when we're talking about climate impacts in TFCAs, we're really talking about also in the context of Kaza of these impacts at scale, given the geographical extent of Kaza. Next, please. Uh, for those that may not be familiar with Kaza, there is a very clear vision that the partner states have agreed upon and also a mission which underscores the importance of harmonization of policies, strategies, and practices. And also to mention here that Kaza is actually a mosaic of land uses, uh, protected areas, community forests, reserves, and others that I've mentioned already. Thank you. Next. So when we're talking about uh, freshwater resources, in the context of Kaza and of course in the context of climate uh, change, we're talking about the two widely shared uh, transboundary river basins, the importance of ecosystems, services and goods, the cultures and traditions of the people that inhabit this important landscape, the contribution of the various resources and biodiversity to economic development, and of course the opportunities and importance of uh, uh, all this in the context of regional integration. Next, please. So when we're talking about uh, freshwater resources, it's about habitats. Within Kaza, we really pay particular attention to the importance of freshwater habitats, the importance of flows or environmental flows in terms of quality, the timing and quantity, the importance of understanding the status and what's happening to surface and underground water resources, the associated biodiversity goods and services, the importance of climate adaptation, and if I may add also the opportunities that we have in terms of mitigation offered by the natural environment, you know, the, the, the natural environment and ecosystems themselves, and the role and impacts of climate on people the institutions, customs, ways of living, and also the economic activities. Next, please. So uh, just to put things in context, when you're talking about Kaza, a lot has been said uh, as it relates to the importance of uh, uh, the headwaters that we find in Angola and other areas outside the Kaza landscape. There's also the importance of major floodplain ecosystems, some outside of uh, the Kaza landscape. And uh, I think the point that I want to emphasize here is around three things. One, the meaningless of boundaries, as we know them institutionally or otherwise, the agency of collective action issues that confront us, the challenges, are not possible without uh, collaboration. And we believe that CASA, as we've been um, already advised, is within SADIC. And uh, as SADIC, we find a lot of opportunities around the regional scope, the protocols that exist, the treaties, and in our particular case, also very important to work with the two river basin organizations, OCACOM and uh, ZAMCOM. And if I may add here, the revised uh, climate change strategy and action plan for SADIC is a key instrument for us to work with because everything has to be aligned to that in this regard. Next, please. So what are some of the pressures that come to mind when we think in terms of climate change? It's agriculture, water and infrastructure, but also importantly, how we operate this. Pollution, unsustainable use and overexploitation, emergence of aquaculture, also navigation. And think of this in the context of a growing population and global warming urban growth, increasing economic activities and public and private sector financing, and of course, climate impact itself. Next, please. When we look at all these pressures, they create 
what we call shared risks in the context of Kaza. These include declining freshwater species, as we've heard already, the fragmentation and degradation of freshwater uh, habitats, and also increasingly altered hydrological and hydromorphological processes, increasing pollution, as well as uh, growing water scarcity. And within, that, within this context, again, the impact this has on livelihoods and economic activities. Next, please. So in Kaza, the question arises, why managing fresh water is important. And uh, uh, the picture that you're seeing there is from uh, the first Kaza uh, uh, freshwater workshop that was held in 2019, towards the end of 2019, under the auspices of the Conservation Working Group of Kaza, which led, among other things, I would be describing very shortly, interventions that have been championed within the Freshwater and Fisheries Subworking Group of Kaza. Next, please. Our first point is really to mention that there's quite a number of uh, fundraising projects, uh, rather fundraising and projects that have been undertaken over the years, especially in the last six years. Uh, I have here some examples. Uh, the Kaza Groundwater Project, which uh, was undertaken in collaboration with IMI and uh, Peace Parks Foundation, which included a number of uh, outputs around the transboundary diagnostic assessment, groundwater quality report, and also a groundwater management framework, and also a gender equity and social inclusion strategy or plan that was developed, and also baseline studies uh, undertaken by different players, if I may add here, including WWF and the World Bay Trust and National Geographic. These include the Kwando River Health Scorecard, the State of Kwando River Basin Report, the framework document that I spoke about in terms of groundwater, uh, Jesse, and also the baseline studies for Kwando and Lungwebungu, as well as Quito. And some of this work has been expanded uh, into other parts of Kaza, but also in collaboration with the Nature Conservancy, really recognizing the importance of science. Uh, the two river basin organizations and Kaza uh, championed the development of the uh, Kaza TFCA freshwater map, a very useful tool uh, that we need, and also projects that have been uh, implemented, such as the automated water quality monitoring uh, uh, project funded by KW and USAID, and also very important as part of the adaptation of water provision for people and wildlife. If I may add here also that uh, within uh, this context, we also have been uh, developing a strategic environmental assessment for the Kwando River Basin, which is a free flowing river within Kazan. By that, I mean there are no major impoundments or dams, for example, or other form of infrastructure that uh, affect the natural flow of that river. And also we have undertaken the development of the Kaza livelihoods and diversification strategy and, and, and underpinning climate risk assessment strategy. If we can move to the next, please. Uh, these are just some of the examples of the various uh, outputs that I've just spoken about. But within this context, we're also paying particular attention to climate impacts at a species level and uh, also at a um, utilization level, for example, in the case of the Kwandulinyanti Chobe River Code of Conduct, which I've highlighted here what might be the implications of climate in terms of developing tourism. Uh, the livelihood uh, focused climate risk adaptation goes into details, providing scientific evidence of the impacts of climate change over the long term. We're looking at about 2050. How does this impact uh, development trajectories for Kaza? And of course, uh, each one of these documents and others that I have uh, highlighted here is looking at climate from a cross-sectoral standpoint. Uh, there are initiatives that have gone into looking at uh, promoting uh, food security, 
sustainable agriculture and uh, water conservation and related initiatives at the household and community levels, encouraging farmers to grow seeds appropriate to their context. So I would say that the approach in Kaza is cross-cutting at different levels in terms of programming, fundraising, law enforcement, species conservation, advocacy, community development, and governance. And of course, scenario planning. And as I mentioned, the SEA that we're in the process of developing is very important in this regard. Research and knowledge creation, and lastly, but not the least, tourism. Next, please. So uh, this is just uh, an example of uh, the work that's been done, uh, the completion and adoption, and adoption of the baseline documents that I mentioned earlier. This is an initiative that was done collectively by the partner states uh, uh, working together with the Zambezi Water Course Commission, ZAMCOM, and of course the Kaza Secretariat. And these are important instruments that are helping the partner states beyond Kaza TFCA as it relates to this uh, landscape. And of course, uh, we also have a recent uh, document which is about to be launched very soon, the Kwando River Integrated Water Resources Management Plan. Next, please. Uh, the Strategic Environmental Assessment, uh, colleagues, uh, there's a goal there. And uh, I think uh, what I want to emphasize here is the natural character of this river system. And maybe questions can be asked. Why are you paying particular attention to this river? Uh, I think, uh, let me move to the next slide. Uh, I'll make the points shortly. Next slide. Yes, again, please. Yeah, I think the point I want to make here is that uh, this is a free flowing river. And if you look around the world, and even, even in the region, there are very few flowing river systems that you have. So planning for the management and uh, utilization of such a river system is very important. And in all this work, CASA works very closely with ZAMCOM as the mandated entity. Of course, ZAMCOM is part of SADIC and CASA is part of SADIC. Yeah. So we are also talking about internal integration between the two SADIC organizations and uh, in supporting this uh, work in line with the provisions of the SADIC uh, protocol on transboundary water courses. And I'm just making reference here also to the regional freshwater meeting that I spoke about earlier. And of course, we are also learning from the OCACOM COB strategic environmental assessment work that was done earlier getting the inspiration and also the drive. Next, please. Okay, we can move. I think a point is made here. So uh, I want to talk about the future outlook and uh, concluding uh, aspects on this particular issue. One, we have to partner as CASA Secretariat with others in terms of uh, actioning the baseline recommendations that have uh, been generated over time. Uh, the MOU with ZAMCOM is a priority. It's been, uh, it's been uh, endorsed at the Joint Management Committee and uh, uh, senior officials level. It's now awaiting uh, ministerial consent. And we already have an MOU with OCACOM. And then we also as CASA TFCA, guided by SADIC, are very clear in our role and mandate, which is to support the two river basin organizations as the mandated institutions. And uh, also we have to activate the freshwater and fisheries sub working group, you know, to be more active and uh, play its part. Uh, and then very important also is the opportunities around focused integration of water in project and program development. And of course, looking out for uh, fundraising opportunities that can help us to advance the work of CASA Secretariat in as far as uh, climate adaptation is concerned. And uh, in doing all this, there are a number of things that have to be very clear. We have to, for example, continue our work such as uh, the Kwandu Joint, through the Kwandu Joint Action Group, which is an initiative that 
was birthed as a result of uh, these collaborations that I'm talking about, strategic communications, and then uh, considering uh, the importance of climate, the imp we need to invest in transformational projects in each uh, uh, component of the, of, of the TFCA. And uh, these uh, transformational projects are actually articulated in the CASA live loose diversification strategy uh, from a live loose standpoint. But we also need to look at those that can be implemented at scale within the landscape itself. And uh, suffice to mention that the live loose diversification strategy and uh, also the live loose forecast climate uh, risk assessment uh, documents that have uh, recently received uh, the SADC uh, heads of, I mean, CASA uh, heads of state uh, directive for us to ensure that they are approved and uh, implementation begins. So on that note, I think uh, this marks the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nyambe. Uh, we'll right away move to our next presenter, who is Lisa Zanerini, the project manager for the TRAIL project implemented in the Lubombo TFCA. Lisa, over to you. Thank you, Seppo. Thanks a lot. Thank you to my colleagues for the very interesting presentation. Uh, so my, my, my job here is to go to community level. So through Ms. Mavimbela, and Mr. Nyambe, we have seen the impact of climate change at global level, actually, at SADAC level and at TFCA level. But actually, the real impact is uh, we can see and we can touch it at community level. So I'm, I'm coming here with my experience, with our experience as COSPE, um, implementing a project aiming at promoting adaptation at community level in rural communities in the Lubombo TFCA. Uh, next, please. So just a brief presentation about COSPE, who is COSPE. So COSPE is an international organization. We have been working in Southern Africa since 1999, and we have uh, different programs aiming at uh, improving the livelihood of rural communities and promoting human rights and democracy. So we have two main pillars in the region. One, again, more on human rights and democracy, and the other one is on climate change and sustainable development. So in the frame of this second pillar that we are going to focus on today, uh, we have different initiatives that we support and we promote, like agroecology, uh, value chain development, participatory natural resource management, adaptation to climate change, um, community tourism, water and sanitation, socioeconomic inclusion and equality. All these activities together, as we know, climate change doesn't have effects on specific sector, but actually is a cross-cutting um, problem that touches different kind of uh, resources and uh, in, uh, natural resources, but also people living in, uh, in, the, in the environment. Next, please. So uh, this specific uh, activity on climate change adaptation is developed through the trade project. The TRAIL project is a project funded by GIZ. It started in 2021 and is still ongoing. And the objective of this project is actually promoting cross-border climate change adaptation in the Lobombo TFCA. In the picture, you see the green areas, are the areas that are um, uh, constituting the Lobombo TFCA. So there are different areas, as you can see. And we do not work in the whole TFCA, in the whole Lubombo TFCA, but if you can see the numbers here, unfortunately are very small, but I hope you can see it more in the number one, so it's the Lubombo Goba TFCA, and in the number uh, five, Uzutu Tembe Futi TFCA. So we work mainly in these two areas and in the three countries, Eswatini, Mozambique, and South Africa. Um, the trail project has got two main outputs that uh, are, used, are useful to achieve the objective. That at one, build more resilient communities in and around the Lubombo TFCA. And output two, strengthen cross-border collaboration and regional integration in the Lubombo TFCA. So today we will focus more in output one. In the strategy we are using to facilitate the adaptation to climate change for rural communities in Eswatini and Mozambique. 
I'm saying a Swatin in Mozambique because we have started this process in these two countries, but hopefully we will move to South Africa so that we have activities and we create resiliency for climate change in the three countries, in the three in communities in the three countries. Next, please. Uh, so how do we do that? So we try to build more resilient communities through a tool that we call local adaptation plan. They are communities adaptation plan or local adaptation plans. They are plans done at community levels where community identify their priorities, the hazards, and identify solutions and stakeholders to respond to climate change and to the different effects of climate change in their own communities. We do it through a participatory process. It's a very quite long process and participatory where you involve different groups in the communities to analyze together uh, what is climate change, to sensitize them to uh, on what climate change is and how climate change is impacting their communities. Actually, it's an open discussion with the communities where the community come up um, with information, usable information, traditional knowledge and ideas uh, on what are the main impacts of climate change in their communities and how they think they can and adapt better to climate change. So as you see, this process is the seven steps process. So the first one is community sensitization on climate change, what it is and what we mean when we talk about climate change. And then the second step is the creation of focus groups. Uh, focus groups are groups that rep are representing the whole community. So inside the focus groups, there are the different um, groups that are active in the community, can be the farmers association, the water committee, can be the um, uh, people living with disability association. As we know, again, climate change is really cross-cutting and really touches different areas, different sectors. And very often climate change has different impact according to your work, according to your community, according to you who you are. A woman will have an impact of climate change that is different from a man or, or from a person living with disabilities. So doing that, we try to really represent the whole community so that we can have a full picture of what is happening um, in the community regarding climate change. And we call up, we talk about focus groups and not group because we create two groups. One is a mixed gender, so where there is uh, there are men and women, and one is made by women only because we feel that it's important to create a safe space where women can openly say what are the impacts, what are the consequences of climate change for themselves in a safe space where they can openly express themselves. Then from the work of these two focus groups, we arrive to a common um, local adaptation plan, integrating the inputs and the information and the contribution from the two focus groups. Uh, so the third step actually is having this training on climate change and coming up with ideas, with inputs, with information from the two focus group on how climate change impact them. So main problems, main priorities, they actually list all the consequences of climate change in their communities. And they try to identify solutions for each and every problem and also the resources. So we try to promote the use of natural resources, local resources available. But in case they are not enough, then which kind of resources are needed and which kind of stakeholders can be involved to work together towards those identified problems. So once we have this local adaptation plan elaborated, we go at community level to um, validate the, the, the local adaptation plan. So in the step four, community validation, then we move on to elaborating an action and monitoring plan because in the local adaptation plan, they identify the priorities, but then they elaborate a, a real action plan where they list the priority and for each priority, they say what they are going to do and when in order to try to target that priority, respond to the priority. And then a monitoring plan so that the focus group itself can monitor the, 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 the implementation of those activities that have been identified over the years, actually. Uh, after this, after having elaborated the uh, local adaptation plan, the monitoring plan and action plan, they go to the chiefdom level where they present their work and they get the final approval from the chiefdom and from the local authorities. 
So these are the seven steps. As you see, it's a circle. And it's a circle because it's a never-ending process, actually. Because as you know, climate change continues. It doesn't end. It doesn't finish after one year. And the, 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 the needs of the communities can be different year after year. After two, three years, maybe some of the measures, the, the most urgent priorities have been solved. But there are other new ones that are coming up. So the, the community actually needs to review it and monitor and modify it and update it uh, regularly. Uh, next, please. So this is uh, the results that we achieved through this uh, the trail project in terms of local adaptation plan. Here that you see here is a picture of one of the focus groups of one of the communities where we work. So up to now, 15 communities uh, have been sensitized and trained on climate change impact and adaptation. 15 local adaptation plans and monitoring plans have been elaborated. Uh, through the local adaptation plan, especially um, from my point of view, we have enhanced the resilience of people, of the communities and ecosystems. And we have promoted a good governance of both natural and human systems, because actually the communities have the tools to define their priorities and then to also guide any other agency or NGO who ever come to the communities, guide them in saying these are the priorities, we need to respond to these priorities. So it really becomes a tool for the community of good governance and um, to better really plan and implement the activities uh, for them to better adapt to climate change. And at the end of the day, the, the communities we are working with are able and independent in mobilizing internal and external resources to respond and adapt to climate change. So bit by bit, they improve their livelihood and their social well-being through the implementation of the identified uh, priorities. Next, please. So th this is the first step. So we elaborate the local adaptation plans. But then, as you know, in the plans, there are a list of actions that the community wants to implement in order to adapt to climate change. So as project, um, we try to support them in implementing at least one of the actions that have been identified. Um, it's not that we are going to respond to all, because as I said, the focus group are going to go and look for more funds, more stakeholders that can come into and support them in solving some of the identified problems. But as 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 as, as project, we try to respond to at least one to see that to show them that even with small resources, because actually what we have allocated are small resources, they can still make the difference and change some of the aspects of the community. So what we request when we when the community identified a pilot action to be implemented is that this action must be benefiting the whole community or most of the communities, not just the focus group. So it's not that the focus group is doing something for themselves, but it's doing something for the community. Um, then the focus group must mobilize the community and must contribute to the finalization of the action. So it's not just the project coming and doing that action, but all together, the focus group, the project and the community work together to implement that identified action. We try to promote the use of natural resources, local resources that are available in the community in order to reduce the costs and also, also in order to demonstrate that they can really implement actions with their own local resources available. And then there is a continuous communication and uh, collaboration between the focus group and the traditional leaders of the community so that the community is always updated what is happening uh, in the focus group and in the implementation of this action plan. So up to now in the trail project, 12 pilot actions were completed, so one per community, and three are under implementation. When we say 12 pilot action, each pilot action can be made up of more components, of course, because if, if you see below, uh, eight water points were fully protected. And when we talk about water points, we, we call about springs. Um, 11 water um, points um, were partially protected. Seven boreholes were rehabilitated. Two agricultural pilot actions implemented. One herd dam was rehabilitated. One flea market was fenced and five wetland protected. So as also my colleagues earlier on already mentioned, so as you can see, um, the, the impact of climate change at community level can really touch different areas. Water, for sure, is the main priorities when we talk about community, but also agriculture, the, the use of local seed varieties, 
or the wetland protection, but also unemployment. Unemployment has been uh, indicated by most of the communities we work with as one of the consequences, so the high rate of unemployment, one of the consequences of uh, climate change. Uh, next, please. So here are some pictures just to show you some of the intervention, just to give an, an, an image to what I'm talking about. Uh, so this is a simple sim spring protection, water point protection. You see the poles uh, that are those collected by the community and the fence was erected by the community. So we come with the expertise, with the materials to protect the, the spring so that the community can, the community can have the small water that they have at least is clear and is available for, for the communities. And if you think about a spring like this can really supply more than 15, 20 homestead and each homestead can be made up of six, seven, eight people. So actually a small action like this can really impact on, on, on maybe pe many people in the community. Next, please. So here are boreholes that have been rehabilitated through the action. So even the fact that there are many boreholes in communities that do not work. Uh, so uh, it's just a matter of rehabilitating what is already there for, for the community to go back to, the, to clean water, to have access to clean water. But very often the services uh, are not available or they are expensive. So it's just a matter to go back uh, with the right technicians and rehabilitate existing points. Next, please. Uh, okay, this is a wetland again, just to show you with the natural, with the simple um, resources available locally, we have fenced a wetland so that is protected and is not damaged by livestock or other agents. Next, please. And this is regarding seeds, uh, as my colleague Mr. Nyambe was saying, local seed varieties are often a very good response to climate change adaptation for communities. Um, actually, the communities are rich of local varieties and they all have somewhere varieties of seeds they are kept when it's, drought, when it's a drought period or when uh, in a very difficult situation. And actually, um, these seeds need to be protected because they are part of their own biodiversity. And the, 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 using hybrids or other kind of seeds, they risk to lose their own richness, their own seeds. So one of the activities that the communities request is to have seeds that are well adapted to their own climatic condition. And often local seeds are the best one that are adapted to the local climatic condition. And through the selection, multiplication of these seeds and conservation of these seeds, they can have materials available in their own communities. And at least food security is assured because they have always seeds in the communities, free that the seeds that they can get easily from the seed bank, plant, multiply, and then go back and uh, give back to the seed banks. So this one is really an adaptation measure at community level that at least in the communities where we work is really fundamental and important. Next, please. And in, when we talk about agriculture, apart from the seeds, is also the use of sustainable agriculture approaches that can conserve the soil, then can reduce the, 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 uh, the wasting of water, that can allow the humidity to sustain the soils with the soil cover, that can improve the fertility of the soil without much um, use of inputs and chemicals. So this general approach, sustainable approach, can really make the difference in the way farmers in rural community can adapt to climate change. Next, please. So this is what is happening at community level. But um, again, uh, we are very much aware that uh, activities at community level only very often does not change the situation at national or even TFCA level. So the LAP is a tool in the hands of the community and we feel it's a very effective tool to change things at community level. But anyway, we are in the country, we are in a TFCA level. So it's very important also to connect to the processes that are happening in, the, in, the, in your country or in your TFCA. 
this is why we have developed this program in three phases, local, regional, and national level. Actually, um, now I'm talking especially about Eswatini, where we are based as COSPE. In Eswatini, we are in the process of starting the elaboration of the national adaptation plan at national level, at policy level, at government level. And we already have the um, NDC, so the national determined contribution. So we feel that as, as, as organization, we had and you have the responsibility to collect the information from community level, to put them together and for them to be resources to elaborate this policy at national level. So that this process at national level doesn't become just a top down approach, but can rely on the contribution on the information, on the inputs of their communities. So this is why we have elaborated a regional integrated adaptation plan, what we call REAP, that try to put together the common hazards and measures in the, in identified in the LAPs and should be a fundamental, uh, should represent fundamental data for developing then the national adaptation plan. So it should strongly contribute to the develop of the national adaptation plan. Um, unfortunately, what we do is in the Lubombo region of Eswatini. So it's one region of the four regions in Eswatini. And as NGO, as CSO, we don't have the power and the energy and the resources to do it in all the country for all the communities. But actually, we are in communication with the Ministry of Natural Resources and with specific departments that are in charge of elaborating the national adaptation plan. And they have seen the importance of it. And we are together trying to replicate it in the other regions, involving other stakeholders, other organizations that can join uh, us in this process so that it becomes a national tool for the communities in the nation, in Nesfatini to contribute to the regional and national documents. Next, please. So um, again, I've already said most of this thing, but uh, we feel that it's really important that national documents like the NAP, the National Adaptation Plan, and the NDC, uh, they are the development guides for the country, but it's also important that they need to consider the lived experience, the data of individuals, the house of communities and region. So they can't be based only on national processes, but they need to take into consideration also what is happening in the communities. And considering that, especially in Eswatini, this is already happening and there are already information available from communities and from regions, I think it's a must to make this information available at national level and at national level to take this information and use them for the elaboration of national documents. Next, please. So this is the, our roadmap, the Regional Integrated Adaptation Plan roadmap uh, that we have discussed together with the Meteorological Department in the Natural Resources, uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources and other key stakeholders. So we are just really going through that. We are, we are working on it. And um, actually we are there. As you see, we are in mid 2024. We have just elaborated it, but the objective is really to arrive to 2026 with uh, the contribution of the, all the different communities in the country having, not maybe all of them, but a good quantity of communities, chiefdoms having their local adaptation plan and really informing at national level on the climate change um, consequences at community level, the problems and the possible solution that can be uh, implemented. And this is actually uh, what is happening in some of the communities in the, in the Lubombo region. So this is our plan. And of course, we are not leaving behind the local adaptation plan at community level because the importance of local adaptation plan at community level is really key because we are realizing that through this tool, community can really easily respond and adapt to climate change. Uh, so yeah, we will continue on both sides, national, regional level and community level. Next, please. Okay, I thank you uh, a lot for the attention and I leave the floor to Seppo and my colleagues. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Lisa. And thank you to the previous two presenters for wonderful presentations, very informative. So please feel free to raise your hand if you have any question or comment. 
I'm um, just monitoring the chat now. We had a comment from patients, which goes talking of adaptation. There is need to pay attention to ecosystem loss and damage, as well as the role of wildlife as enablers in en enhancing our adaptive capacity and strengthening the resilience of our social ecological systems. So that's just a comment. I don't know if anybody from the panel would like to say anything to that. Okay, otherwise I just move on to, there's a question now from Olga, which says, considering that Kaza has rich heritage sites, in what way is Sadi harnessing the UNESCO heritage-based policies and initiatives to promote the nexus between climate change, cultural heritage, and biodiversity conservation for resilience building? I see Dr. Nyambe, you already said something, Ed. Would you like to respond to that? In real time, please. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, it's just to acknowledge that uh, in Kaza, for example, there already exist uh, some World Heritage Sites and there are plans to uh, possibly expand the boundaries of the Okavango uh, Delta World Heritage Site to include the Namibian and Angolan components. And the three partner states have had uh, discussions and uh, working collaboration with UNESCO. So that, that for me is uh, just an example of uh, some of the already ongoing initiatives in this regard. Of course, we already have the Victoria Falls and uh, Sodilo Hills. They, the values articulated for the justification of uh, uh, establishment of these World Heritage Sites actually are cross-cutting. They look at the socio-ecological aspects the, and also the historical and cultural values. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nyambe. Whilst you're still there, there's another question from Paul, uh, which says, has just a moment, has a CASA TFC developed a sustainable funding strategy for strategies and activities to mitigate the impact of climate change as presented? <clears throat> so, Again, a very important question, but I think I was also very clear uh, during my presentation that um, uh, this is collaborative work and um, uh, the Secretariat has to work very closely with the two river basin organizations and, of course, guided by SADIC. Uh, there's no um, costed action plan at the moment, but if you look at the livelihood diversification strategy, uh, it has uh, uh, transformational project ideas that have been developed for purposes of assisting uh, the development of livelihoods interventions. However, what we're talking about here is about comprehensiveness. So we also need to look at the ecological side and the hydrological side. And of course, the Kaza Secretariat is not mandated on uh, some of the aspects, but we definitely are working very closely with the two river basin organizations and um, also, of course, SADIC in terms of how Kaza Secretariat can play its part. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nyambe. There's the hand from Nunes. Uh, thank you very much, Ma Madam Chair. I uh, really commend the presenters for the insightful presentation that they brought us. I don't know if I'm am I audible. Sometimes my laptop is messed up with my... Can I carry on? Yeah. Yes, okay. we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, my interest was has to do with the presentation by Lisa Cospe on the experience of developing national adaptation plans. I wanted, this is a learning process and it might be um, used as a good experience if we wish to expand on how to adapt uh, TFCA's facing challenges or uh, climate change challenges. At what point or at what stage is this document uh, approved, if I may put that, that that way, so that it's not just a plan that is developed, but at least a document that guides um, all, all those who are the key stakeholders 
uh, that are working in Libombo um, landscape. I think this is critical so that we can learn, take this as a good lesson and possibly share with other, other countries. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Can I Lisa, would you like to respond me? to that? Yes. Yes, we can you. hear you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, as a community document, it is an approved document at shipdom level, at, at uh, in Eswatini we call them in Kundl level, so at province level, sort of district level. So it's a community, is a document that is approved by the local um, traditional authority and uh, is a document that is recognized at uh, community level. At uh, regional and national level, we are in the process of recognizing it um, with the uh, government and with the Ministry of Natural Resources. This is the one that's in charge of the national adaptation plan process. So we are in this process at national level. Um, we already had the initial meetings and the initial exchanges. And as I was mentioning in my presentation, the idea could be to validate the methodology at national level. So of course, this is our methodology that we propose, but can be reviewed, can be improved, can be changed. So our idea is to put the methodology at disposal of the different stakeholders, review it together at national level in a, with the different stakeholders, the ministry, but also other organizations working on climate change adaptation, then find the methodology that we all agree on and that we feel is the best one for the local environment and the local uh, context, and then have the final approval and proceed it also in the other regions. So that is the plan. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Does that answer your question, Nunesh? Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, do respond. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. So there's another question from Olga in the chat, which says, great work on climate change and transboundary river systems. How about climate vulnerability assessments for other wetlands and riparian based ecosystems, which support diverse livelihoods in SADC TFCAs? I'm not sure uh, if Dr. Nyembe or Subongile would like to respond to that. Sorry, I missed the question. I okay, I'll just read it again. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, it says, great work on climate change and transboundary river systems. How about climate vulnerability assessment for other wetlands and riparian-based ecosystems which support diverse livelihoods in SADC TFCAs? Okay. Uh, from the water sector side, we do have a, a climate change resilience strategy for all uh, water sources that includes wetlands, um, but not specifically in TFCAs. It's, it's all wetlands uh, and all water bodies in the region. So I don't know if that would help, but I, I'm sure it would be applicable. Um, it would be an applicable document to utilize. Thank you. Thank you very much. Olga, would you like to elaborate further or, or is that does that respond to your question? Oh, I uh, th thank you, uh, Sepo. I think, um, yes, of course, we do have regional plans, but localization, local initiatives to promote um, local adaptation is actually key to promoting resilience. How are we domesticating uh, the regional policies and plans uh, within TFCAs? Thank you. Perhaps one of the TFCAs would like to respond to that, or SADC? Is there any implementation at TFCA levels of these policies? OK. 
Okay, I think we'll come back to that one, Olga. Can Maybe I, can I just speak? To... Can I speak to that? Uh, yes, example. please go ahead, Antonio. I think we need to understand TFCAs as uh, not being separate from uh, uh, from um, the national and uh, regional jurisdiction. They are very much a part of uh, the say the Sadiq uh, climate uh, uh, strategy. And uh, also, I think it was mentioned that uh, the individual partner states have developed their NAPAs, the National Adaptation Plans. And these have taken into consideration these um, uh, social ecological requirements and the vulnerabilities of particular areas within their jurisdictions. So it's really a question of how actually we can also utilize um, the instruments and and uh, tools that have been developed, not necessarily for these areas called TFCAs, because when countries are thinking, they are thinking about their various freshwater ecosystems, and not just because they exist within uh, a TFCA or not. And I think that's also the point that Simongila was making in terms of uh, the, the work that's been done at SADC level and uh, its uh, relevance to other areas in the member states' uh, jurisdictions, as they do not necessarily need to be called uh, or be associated with the T TFCA, so to speak. However, understanding that the TFCAs are generally large areas, so scope matters, and uh, they provide an opportunity for us to take the various interventions to scale understanding also the importance of uh, transboundary collaboration between uh, different partner states or member states. Therefore, TFCAs have a unique contribution to make in terms of advancing both uh, um, in advancing uh, vulnerability strategies and all other interventions around adaptation and uh, mitigation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Nyam, there's a hand from, uh, and forgive me if I pronounce your name incorrectly, El Butcher from Mozambique. Please go ahead. Uh, you're muted. Okay, we'll try and get back to you, El. Um, there's another comment in the chat, which um, from Stanley, which says, talking about the impact of climate change, mitigation and adapt adaptation, there is need to take into account community well-being and citizen science. I suppose this also refers to indigenous knowledge, uh, Stanley, is that correct? I'm not sure if Stan is still there. There's a, a question now from Jen. This is directed to Lisa Zanarini. Uh, do you go into any kind of biodiversity slash conservation agreements with, uh, just a moment. Um, sorry, my chat is, yeah. Do you go into any kind of biodiversity slash conservation agreements with the community in lieu of the support provided to ensure continued buy-in? Or is it a donation, especially in the case of the physical materials? Yes, yes, thank you, Seppo. Uh, actually, no, it's a, it's a donation. We don't have any agreement with them. Um, we use the pilot action as a way to show them how they can easily easily okay can they can uh, implement activities to respond to climate change and to adapt to climate change also using their natural resources and of course we come in with some support especially in terms of those materials that is not available in the communities uh, but no there is no agreement uh, the only agreement we can say that is in place is for them uh, to have the local adaptation plan as a tool to to monitor also through the monitoring plan, to monitor what is happening and continue implementing the activities identified. 
right. Thank I you very much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that's fine for Jen. So there's another question. I suppose this is the one that Bell Butcher wanted to ask. How how are adaptation LAPs implemented? Uh, yes, there is a methodology, a specific methodology that we have uh, elaborated. Actually, there are other countries where the local adaptation plans are implemented. We uh, started, let's say, uh, designing our methodology, taking the, the, the LAP implemented in Nepal, uh, because actually Nepal is one of the main, um, the most active countries in elaboration of LAP and in using the LAP as a tool for the communities. So we have started from there, but of course we adapted the methodology to the Lubombo uh, environment and to the Lubombo social uh, context. And uh, we have reviewed it and we have designed in the seven steps as you have, as I have shared. Um, in case someone is interested, I can share the methodology um, without any problem. I'd be more than happy to do that. All right, thank you very much. So we are running out of time. We are supposed to end at half three, but um, we still have one last presentation to go. So I think we'll jump into that one right away. And please remember that we'll share all these presentations that have been presented today. And if you have any questions, please, you can still continue writing them in the chat and we'll see how we can uh, respond to them, perhaps via email. So we'll move to the next presenter. We will have a short presentation from a GIZ project called the Global Initiative for Disaster Risk Management, which uh, will talk about um, integrating disaster risk planning uh, in TFCAs and also how to link the community of practice for climate change with the disaster risk management community. Over to you, Margaret. Hi, Tef Sepo. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to present on the work that we do as the GIDRM static component. Um, with in relation to uh, TFCA's confronting climate change. You can please move on to the next slide. Basically, this the GIDRM overview, please. Yes, this pretty much gives a, 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 an overview <coughs> on the work that we do. We are mandated to strengthen the use of disaster risk management approaches as integrated solutions in selected German partner countries and regions. And within the static component, which I'm a part of, we are focused on mainstreaming uh, disaster risk management and risk-informed development within the GIZ Nexus cluster projects, and by extension, their political counterparts and other partners. If you can look at the diagram on the right, um, you may be asking yourself, what is the Nexus uh, cluster? These, uh, this consists of projects that are rooted within the climate, energy, and natural resources sectors. Um, as you can see there, we've got the energy sector, we've got the water sector, as well as the NRM and food sector, where we find the TFCAs. And also why, perhaps you might ask yourself, why the Nexus cluster um, approach. Um, we believe that risks or disaster risks are systemic in nature, and that is their impacts can cascade and spread across systems and various sectors. Thus, it is pertinent that sectors that have overlaps work together to address these risks. For instance, um, within a TFCA, there'd be agricultural activities, there's energy use, as well as the presence of river basin organizations. Um, we also work very closely, uh, the GIDRM also works very closely with the static disaster risk reduction units. Next slide, please. Um, under theory, I'm not sure why it looks like that, but under theory of change, it pretty, there, there are two last rows there that aren't showing. But under theory of change, um, it is pretty much the methodology. I'm not going to go into it because we're out of time, but it is pretty much the methodology we use in mainstreaming DRM within our targeted projects. Uh, next slide, please. 
This slide looks at the link between climate change and DRM. Um, typically, um, the wording still doesn't show, I don't know why, but typically DRM and climate change communities of practice um, deal with these two issues independently. However, we believe that they're heavily interrelated. Um, we believe that climate change is a disaster risk driver because there's mention of anomalies in temperature as well as precipitation, which can, for instance, lead to extreme rainfall and drought, as already highlighted um, by the previous speakers. And these have over the years led to an increasing intensity and frequency of extreme events and disasters, as shown on the graph below. I mean, we can see that there's an upward trend in the occurrence of disasters. Next slide, please. Um, there is no doubt that risk, next slide please, oh, thank you. There's no doubt that risk is increasing faster than it can be managed. And again, this was depicted in the previous graph, which showed uh, an upward trend of occurrence and disasters. Now, RID, this risk-informed development that we're talking about, um, not only considers risks to development, as with traditional risk analysis, but it also looks into risks created by those development. It further acknowledges the interaction between multiple threats and also encourages risk governance. Now, how do we, next slide please, sorry. Now, how do we implement this risk-informed development that I've just been talking about? We are currently using the ee for it framework, which prescribes conditions needed to integrate risks in development and decision-making processes. Now, this includes an analysis into organizational arrangements, partnerships and collaborations, finance and resources, policy and regulation, knowledge and information, as well as people culture and the environment. Next slide, please. And you might be wondering why all of this matters to TFCAs um, in relation to climate change. Well, firstly, I should say that it is pertinent to thoroughly incorporate risk-informed development into TFCA development and management plans. Why? Because risk-informed development avoids creating risk through poor development choices it uses development to reduce hazard, vulnerability, and exposure. It protects development from the impact of hazards. It supports climate change adaptation, makes development more resilient and sustainable, and it also builds coherence, unlocks synergies, and program optimization across policy silos. I mean, for instance, um, in the case of the CASA TFC, um, I read that there's a growing population which can lead to rapid land transformation, which in turn leads to deforestation. I mean, if there's an increasing consumption, there'll be an increasing emission of climate changing greenhouse gases. And that's um, why it is important to view development um, around all of these things that I've spoken about from a systemic risk lens that could have impacts cascading through various systems in sectors. Again, I think just in, I mean, I've said a lot within five, the five minutes that I've, I've been given, but again, all of this is to just say that let us not only consider risks to development, but also risks that can be created by those developments. Um, thank you. Thanks, Sepo. Thank you very much, Maggie, and uh, sorry about the rush. We <laughs> got too <laughs> yeah. comfortable with the interesting discussions we had earlier, but thank you so much for your presentation as well. I don't know if there are any questions from the audience. Okay. Okay, so... We've come to the end of our webinar today. I'd like to thank you very much for joining us today and also for sticking around until the end. We've had very good presentations from uh, the national level, local level, and also how we can integrate 
uh, disaster risk management in TFCA management and so on. So we'd like to thank you very much and a very special thank you to the presenters for putting in all the effort and also for responding to the questions as best as you could. So this comes, this brings us to the end of our webinar and um, we look forward to hosting you again in our next webinar whose uh, topic and date we will communicate um, soon. So thank you very much and have a good rest of the week. Goodbye.